Good morning, everyone, and welcome to St. Luke's Sunday Forum. We're thrilled that you're here. We're happy to begin the school year with a very special guest, Dr. Evan Anderson, who is a professor of pediatrics medicine at Emory University and also is the principal investigator of the cl clinical trial unit. Uh, this uh, wonderful, blessed human being is at the middle of our discovering and finding a vaccine and helping it to get to the place where it can be marketed. And uh, we're gonna explore with him all the journey of that and how, what he's doing and uh, what, are gonna, what are some real signs of success and hope and what life is gonna be like after uh, the uh, vaccine is here, a whole wide range of things. But first, let's welcome Dr. Evan Anderson. Thank you so much for being with us, doctor. You're very welcome. It's my pleasure to join you and looking forward to the discussion. Thank you very, very much. So um, am I right? What we're doing, well, first, uh, let's just start at the 30,000 feet. There are a number of trials going on throughout the world. You are conducting a very important one that is anchored at Emory and also in Washington State, I understand. And all of it is being overseen by a, a network of coordination, uh, not the least of which is through the National Institutes of, of Health. Will you just kind of tell us about the scope of what's going on? Yeah, so we had the fortune of getting to be involved with the phase one study of the Moderna mRNA vaccine. Uh, so that was the first study of uh, this vaccine in humans. Uh, is what the phase one study is. Um, and from that standpoint, uh, in conjunction with our colleagues in Washington State, Lisa Jackson, uh, my colleague Nadine Rufael here at Emory University and my team uh, was um, able to be involved with administering the vaccine to some of the first people here in the US and in generating the data that then is supporting the later phase studies, the phase two and the phase three study, that will hopefully um, move the vaccine closer to potentially being licensed. But we're in phase one right now, is that correct? So the phase one, it continues on. So uh, everyone has been fully enrolled into that study into a number of different dosing regimens um, or dos dosages of uh, the vaccine. And then they're continuing in long-term follow-up for a year uh, after they'd received the vaccine. But things are moving fast in the vaccine clinical development pathway. The phase two study opened then based off of the data that we had generated, um, looking at um, two doses, either a 50 microgram dose or a 100 microgram do dose. And that uh, had generated enough data to then open the phase three study, which we're involved with as well. Um, which will be 30,000 people here in the United States. And that study is uh, enrolling quickly. Oh, very good. And you expect it to actually begin when? Phase so that three. study, the phase three is actually ongoing. So okay. we've, uh, um, uh, thousands of patients have been enrolled here in the U.S. already. I see. Now let's step, uh, just a step before the clinical trials, who was developing the actual vaccine and how did they do that? Great question. So, so um, the, the vaccine development for, uh, for SARS coronavirus 2, which is the virus which causes COVID, um, was really facilitated greatly by a real investment that's been made at, um, in terms of basic science research and in terms of clinical uh, research of early vaccine candidates, there had been emergence of two different coronaviruses previously. One was the original SARS coronavirus in 2003. The second one was a um, virus called uh, MERS uh, um, coronavirus. And the emergence of both of those coronaviruses um, had people uh, concerned about the possibility that another coronavirus could ultimately emerge, and that's what ended up happening. In the meanwhile, uh, there had been a, a real effort to, um, to understand what um, confers in a, an effective immune response against 
uh, against the coronaviruses, and it was identified that the spike protein, which is the, the, um, the little spike sticking off the ball of coronavirus, that right. that was really important in terms of uh, the immune response to the other coronaviruses. And knowing that, it really facilitated being able to move much more quickly into humans than we normally would had this virus emerged completely out of nowhere. Oh, we're fortunate about that. Because this is quite a journey. I mean, I've heard that sometimes it takes 18 months to get to market on this. Is that what your thinking is? Yeah, so for many vaccines, it can take much longer than 18 months. It can take uh, even a decade for a, vir for a vaccine to move all the way through the stages of, uh, of development here. Um, it was really facilitated based off of the prior work that had been done on the other related coronaviruses, so that um, uh, those that were developing the vaccine had a good idea of what the target was likely to be. And then the FDA uh, allowed for, um, for the initial testing of, um, of this vaccine to happen in parallel with the um, animal studies. Uh, uh, at this occurring at the same time, and that then cut a bit of time off the process um, of uh, the vaccine development. And all that animal data is now um, published for this vaccine, and more is coming for the other vaccines. Um, and the data looks very, very good um, from the standpoint of supporting uh, the movement into the phase three study. Got it. So how many different studies are going on concurrently <laughs> right now? So uh, there has been a veritable explosion of, uh, of efforts to develop a vaccine. And this is great, I think, from multiple different standpoints. Uh, we will ultimately need more than one vaccine. Uh, no individual vaccine manufacturer is going to be able to meet the worldwide need that's, that exists um, mm -hmm. for, for a vaccine. As well, there's concerns about whether some of the vaccine constructs will be stable enough, say, to uh, move into Africa or other or other um, countries or continents where there's problems with uh, excuse me problems with the cold chain uh, requirement, um, where you can't guarantee that the vaccine will be you know maintained at a refrigerated temperature or at a in a uh, um, uh, in a freezer, for, for example. Um, so we really do need multiple vaccines to be moving forward from my perspective in order to meet the global need that uh, will exist for, for having a vaccine. Currently, there's about 30 that are in uh, wow. actual human trials now, which wow. is really astounding. And yeah. it's using a wide variety of different um, approaches, some of which have been more classic uh, vaccine approaches and others are using new the advances that technology have brought um, to to be able to move more quickly um, into uh, into clinical trials. An example of that would be the mRNA vaccine. Uh, really, a huge advance from the scientific standpoint that at least so far is looking uh, promising. Yeah. So, who will determine which vaccines go to market? How will that happen? Yeah, so, so all vaccines have to move through three different stages um, of clinical trials in humans. So there's the phase one study, phase two, and phase three studies that uh, need to be conducted. From that standpoint, um, the whole process has is, is been developed over a period of many decades. And I think one thing that's very reassuring about that process is that uh, only one vaccine in the past 20 plus years has been taken off the market once it's been licensed uh, due to a safety concern. Um, and so the process itself is very good as far as identifying potential safety issues um, that could exist. It can't pick up very, very remote um, risk, meaning one in 10,000, one in 100,000 risk but it is a process that's been tried and tested over the course of time and, and really um, uh, is been able to generate um, 
uh, sufficient safety data and data supporting whether or not the vaccine actually works um, such that, uh, that uh, the public can have confidence in, in uh, a vaccine that's licensed. Got it. You know, I'm flashing on being a kid. I'm 72. And so when the polio vaccine came to yep. be, we lined up in public schools yep. everywhere and we all got the vaccine. I mean, is that a kind of a imagination about what is going to happen? So that's a, that's a great analogy. In many ways, I feel like this is the polio vaccine effort in our generation um, from the standpoint that here we have a disease for which we can do very, very little um, uh, besides support patients through the process. And uh, yet there can be a potential ability to completely protect against disease if the vaccine or vaccines end up being successful. And so uh, I, in talking with participants actually in the phase three study um, uh, and asking some of the older ones about um, their memories of polio, um, it actually uh, does ring some bells for them. And for me, I see a lot of analogies from what I what I've heard about that, uh, about the um, polio vaccine clinical trials back then, and uh, the tremendous impact that it had upon really a whole generation as far as preventing them from uh, developing polio illness. Yeah, I remember my parents being so happy, and I was so scared because I was about to get the vaccine. So what is <laughs> what, what cognitive dissonance going on? You know, right. But, uh, I can just imagine the globe celebrating right. the arrival of this vaccine. And because what I am, you know, I'm not a scientist, but because the kind of, this, <coughs> pardon me, the sense that I have that, you know, we are all um, subject to this until we're all vaccinated because right. it travels so quickly it really is going to have to be a global event. Right. Um, from my standpoint, I, I, th I think it's absolutely critical that, that um, uh, efforts be made to develop and ultimately license vaccine worldwide and to be able to roll out vaccine worldwide. Otherwise, we will continue to see um, the emergence of outbreaks of COVID-19 among either unvaccinated populations or undervaccinated populations, populations at risk, such as homeless individuals, um, people in nursing homes, or people that don't have a good immune response, those that are immunosuppressed. Um, so it, um, it's crucial that, um, that uh, uh, we really work hard to um, ensure that, that uh, any vaccine that is developed can be used and available to everyone. Right. It really drives home for me, from my theological way of thinking, the reality that we are one. Uh, we are a human community, not just a human race, you know. That's an excellent point. Um, I think uh, in the midst of the current uh, political um, situation and the ideologic um, uh, uh, walls that have been built up, um, uh, viruses don't care about those. Um, they, they leap through ideology and uh, unfortunately affect us all. And they remind us that, uh, that we are one community and that, um, that uh, as such, uh, we need to be caring about our brothers and sisters uh, kind of around the world. And mm -hmm. uh, um, that what happens for them is relevant for us. Yeah. So beautifully said. Thanks, doctor. Um, so when do you think, and I'm, I'm not trying to get into the prediction, you know, game here. Um, and I am a leader of a spiritual community, just dying to get back together, you know, body to body in the room. And we're putting a limit on 10 people outside, you know, and only like five people inside in the we have a singer in one room because of what happens when you sing and exuberant preachers in the other room because of what happens. 
get full of the bold gospel and <clears throat> you know, and the organist in another room and all that kind of stuff. And um, and and we're having to say, we we can't do it. Worship has got to be safe. Yes, yes, yes. So wait, wait, wait. And I must say, I'm really dying to get with my brothers and sisters and and sing together and all that stuff. So are, when do you think that the, the vaccine is going to come to market? So it, it's a great question, the million dollar question. <laughs> yeah. um, uh, um, uh, the answer is as quickly as we humanly can. Uh, the good news is, is that uh, the um, Moderna vaccine and the Pfizer mRNA vaccine have both moved into phase three clinical trials. And this is the last kind of trial before a vaccine can be licensed. So from that standpoint, it's uh, typically looking in, in for the phase three studies for, um, for, for COVID-19, it's looking in the range of 30,000 individuals that'll be enrolled into these studies and looking at the safety in those that get vaccine and the safety in those that get the placebo, which is literally salt water. And right. then as well, following those individuals over the course of time, um, in the midst of everyone's daily lives, we know that there's some risk of COVID-19. And following them for any evidence of uh, COVID-19 illness, and then bringing them in, doing the nose swabs that uh, you've seen on television, and uh, looking for COVID-19. And then what will happen is that they'll assess um, the number of cases in those that receive the vaccine and the number of cases in those that get the placebo. And hopefully that the number of those that um, have cases in placebo is really different than the number that have it in the um, vaccine. And so from that standpoint, there's kind of a couple key questions. So uh, that will determine how quickly. So it's dependent upon how many um, how many uh, individuals enroll in the study, the studies, how big those studies are. Again, here they're very, very large studies to try and get answers quickly. The burden of circulating COVID-19 at the time. So if there's very little circulating disease, it'll take longer for um, the study to have enough cases to be able to identify a difference. And then as well, um, it'll depend upon um, well, those are a couple of the key things that, that uh, things will depend upon. Um, all of us are very, working very, very hard to try and enroll this, in our example, of the Moderna study, but I know the Pfizer sites are also trying to do the same thing from their standpoint, uh, such that um, hopefully we'll start to see a big divergence as far as the number of cases in the two groups. Of course, the safety is monitored on an ongoing basis. and. Uh, from that standpoint, any safety signal could end up stopping the study early. Uh, but people will be followed for a couple years after they receive the vaccine for kind of long-term safety. And then that'll hopefully also give us a better idea about the durability of the immune protection from the vaccine. Got it. So, doctor, after we've got the vaccine, and we're pretty sure that we have a distribution system globally. Um, my understanding from you scientists is that the coronavirus is not just going to go away. Uh, we are going to have to contend with it and protect ourselves from it for a long period of time. Does that also mean that we will have to participate in the mitigation um, exercises we're going, like, are we going to have to continue to wear a mask after there's a vaccine? Oh, that, that's the billion dollar question. So, ah! <laughs> <laughs> so, um, so here's my take, and this is mostly opinion. We're, we're kind of going into the area where there's not a lot of data, and uh, it's a little bit speculative, uh, but that's okay. Um, uh, but this is my opinion and, and take it for what it's worth. I think that if, if uh, we can identify a vaccine that's very effective, so that's one of the key things. So vaccines may have variable efficacy and we'll find that out from the phase three clinical trial. But if we have a very effective vaccine, 
And then if we can have most of the population receive the vaccine, that will help prevent ongoing transmission of COVID-19. And that'll give us the best chance of getting back to normal, so to speak. Right. And so I wanna be there with you um, from the standpoint of um, being able to go to sporting events, being able to go to church, being able to do, you know, not be afraid of someone singing in, uh, in the church that, um, that I'm gonna get COVID-19 from that individual who's singing. I, I think that if we've got a very effective vaccine and if, and this is a big question, if people are willing to and go ahead and get vaccinated, we can really drive risk of trans, risk way down um, of, uh, of ongoing transmission in the community. And that will be crucial in terms of getting us back to normal. Got it. Oh, my heart beats fast <laughs> with all of this. I'm very excited. Yeah, I think all of us would love to be there. And, and yeah. you know, I think for um, those in your congregation that are older, it's gonna be important for them to to ensure that if there is a safe and effective vaccine that they get vaccinated, they get, it looks like it'll probably be two doses of vaccine. Um, we'll have a better idea over the course of time, the durability of that immune response. Will it, will you need a booster dose at some point in the future? That we don't know. But I think another important thing to kind of keep in mind is that I think very likely um, we'll need to be evaluating the vaccine as well in children. Um, because we know that children in general are big transmitters of viruses. If you've ever had a child or a grandchild, you know that, that they, yeah. they, uh, they have gotten you sick probably more than once. Um, right. uh, and so it needs to be, any vaccine that ends up being licensed will need to be tested and evaluated in kids. And then uh, if, if it looks safe and effective in that population, I think it will be needed. I mean, we're seeing kids getting critically ill, some occasionally dying here in the US from COVID-19. So, um, so ensuring that we can roll it out to the entire population and we know that it's safe and effective in all populations is gonna be really important. Uh, um, I think uh, another key thing which um, uh, had come up in the midst of discussion before, uh, before we started this uh, conversation was just uh, the fact that, that I do think that it will need to be available to the general population. Um, so I literally had a homeless person who resided in a neighbor's um, house actually die of COVID-19. Um, that individual slept in their basement routinely. They're very gracious people and they let him sleep there, but he actually acquired COVID-19 and was afraid to go to the hospital because of, um, because of the possibility that he would get deported. He'd, he'd uh, entered the US illegally, but he, he was so afraid of going to the hospital that he stayed in the basement and ended up not surviving COVID-19. And it's this, it's this terrible tragedy on so many levels um, uh, that, uh, that highlights some of the issues that are going on in our country um, right now. Stay with that and, and continue to tell us about vulnerable communities that are kind of particularly vulnerable in this time. They're vulnerable in general, but um, this is su such a heartbreaking experience for certain segments of the human family. Right. Um, <clears throat> uh, you absolutely are highlighting an important issue. Uh, unfortunately for many infectious diseases, they're, um, they are disproportionately affecting uh, people of color and people um, of different racial um, backgrounds than myself and yourself. Um, uh, examples would be tuberculosis, um, uh, influenza, many other um, uh, infectious diseases tend to hit harder in other um, populations where there are socioeconomic differences that exist and where, um, where there's more crowding and where you know, uh, people are essential workers and having to go to work at the grocery store every day, um, despite the fact that there's the stay at home orders. Um, and so, so there has been this disproportionate impact upon people of color um, uh, um, of different racial and ethnic uh, backgrounds um, that uh, is quite unjust, but um, so, 
uh, for a number of different vaccines um, in the past, a great example would actually be the pneumococcal vaccine. Um, uh, that has actually erased a lot of the racial differences that exist in kids as far as risk of invasive pneumococcal disease. Um, a lot of the difference that had existed in the rates in African Americans versus um, whites were erased once the vaccine could be widely used because it was effective in terms of preventing disease. Got it. So uh, this, what systems need to change, Dr. Anderson, so that we aren't having this heartbreaking disparity of mortality because of the coronavirus? Yeah, it's a great question. Um, uh, certainly, uh, access to care is a big is a big issue. Um, I think, uh, for um, example, of that uh, homeless neighbor of mine uh, was an issue of being afraid of you know being deported, you know, and and being unwilling to go to the hospital. He could have. Uh, I think he probably would have survived the hospital. Um, hospitalization with supportive care, but uh, um, uh, due to just his fear of being deported, he, he chose not to go into the hospital. And, and to the extent that we can, we can improve access to care, to the extent that, um, that uh, um, we can um, uh, try and ensure that others, that essentially everybody can receive vaccine, I think that would be very, very helpful in terms of uh, uh, helping us to move past COVID-19. Got it. Um, and there's probably even better answers than the one I gave, but uh, um, that's my two cents. Well, you brought up two very, very important policies where we need, we people of justice need to bring justice. And one is healthcare access and another is immigration policies so that people who are immigrants who are here are not afraid. And right. And, the, and that fear becomes, in a really strange way, death knell, even suicidal, you know. To, so I really appreciate your pointing that up. I, um, I want to shift to um, a theological perspective that I have that God is in our work. And I'd love for you to just talk about your daily work. I know you get a million emails a day and all of that, and you've got a huge team to keep going, but can you just give us a glimpse into the daily life of Evan Anderson, MD? Um, so, so my life's probably a bit different than most of you um, from the standpoint that, uh, that uh, in the midst of the stay at home orders and the uh, efforts to have social distancing, uh, things have not changed at all for me from, uh, from the start of COVID, they've only intensified. Um, uh, much longer days than I usually would have been spending previously. Uh, um, and uh, um, we've had to reprioritize a number of different uh, studies and efforts in order to support the COVID uh, response. Um, uh, it, um, someone gave an analogy not uh, too long ago um, uh, that I think actually came um, from uh, from uh, a, a editorial that um, that there was kind of a concept that you know you could have a, a blizzard, a winter, or an ice age. And at the beginning, this was feeling like a blizzard, um, but uh, at this point, I think all of us are uh, needing to adjust to the fact that this is more of an ice age of sorts. Um, uh, from the standpoint of uh, needing to persist with our some of the changes that have happened to our daily lives and to get used to that and to then begin to um, function within uh, the context of those changes and to find ways to have joy in the midst of tremendous um, sorrow and heartbreak and uh, challenges that exist on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, I am touched by that call to both persistence 
and also to find ways to celebrate life and its joys, mm -hmm. even in the midst of some very bleak experiences. Um, what comes to your mind about how you have um, kind of evolved as um, a, a spiritual person in, in both the persistence and also without being in denial about the heartbreak, finding joys in, in the midst of it. Yeah, so, so I think a few things. So um, one is uh, just the tremendous progress that science has been able to make over a fairly short time uh, as far as providing better answers for uh, how do we treat patients with COVID-19? How do we help them to, um, to survive whenever possible or decrease their length of hospitalization? I think that we've had tremendous advances on those fronts. Um, we've seen tremendous compassion from a wide variety of uh, different providers um, who have risen to the challenge of um, going to work every day. Uh, for my myself, I think that um, that getting to be a part of the um, the response from a vaccine effort is incredibly rewarding, although uh, at times fairly challenging. Um, uh, I do feel like I'm making a difference um, as far as moving um, uh, vaccines forward in general. Um, uh, I think though that. Um, that uh, in the midst of this, at least for myself, it's been incredibly uh, helpful for me to, um, this is speaking as, a, um, as an individual, uh, it's been incredibly helpful for me as a person of faith to, um, to be able to still listen to the, um, the sermons and to, uh, to engage from a spiritual standpoint in the midst of uh, this time. And uh, we've, <clears throat> had a number of uh, podcasts that our church has put on that have been very helpful for me to stay oriented every day because in the midst of uh, in the midst of um, hundreds of emails and immediate challenges and uh, requests it uh, is sometimes easy to get very disoriented and to lose track of uh, lose track of what's important and uh, um, so I'm very grateful for uh, in my own uh, circumstance. I'm very grateful for my own church. So can you, that, that's so important. So I, I just want to emphasize, here you are, an extremely busy person, um, an awful lot on your shoulders. And I don't want to diminish at all the fact that you really are in a rewarding situation. And the globe is really kind of applauding you and saying, go Evan, go. And we're all really, really thrilled that you're doing what you're doing and that, that science is offering such hope to us. And yet in the midst of all that business, busyness, you are taking time to keep yourself focused and centered. Mm -hmm. um, can, you, can you give us a little bit more of that? Because I think that's an inspiring thing for everybody who's listening no matter how challenged your life is right now, either by busyness or bleakness, that we all have the responsibility to stop and get a word of fortification and hope and centeredness. Can you just say some more about that? Yeah, I think that um, it's been a very disorienting time for many people. Um, we've lost our social interactions, we've lost our ability to go to sporting events, we've lost our ability to um, engage with our neighbors, we've lost our ability to, to uh, <clears throat> be in, have physical touch um, for some people uh, who've had to shelter in place and you know, may not have any family. Uh, and I really feel for those people because you know, I'm very blessed with having a wife and kids who I can hug at the end of the day, and and uh, yet many people don't have that. Um, for me, though, it is um, in the midst of a million competing demands. It is um, 
quite a challenge to um, to remain tethered to to kind of what's important. That um, as important as this work may be, um, uh, um, ultimately at the end of the day, it probably won't be on my gravestone. Um, uh, it'll, um, I'll be buried next to my wife, I'm sure, but uh, hopefully close to my kids. Um, so I think that, you know, being able to remember that is uh, really important. And being able to remember that, um, that uh, um, uh, <clears throat> that there are um, more important things even than one's work, even when one's work is important, uh, that, um, that, uh, that there are some potential uh, eternal things that are actually far more important and being ready and prepared. You know, we never know when, uh, when we might get hit by a bus or, you know, um, acquire COVID-19 or, you know, have a car crash on the way home and being, um, being at peace um, spiritually is actually a very important thing. Yeah. And also the people around you, Dr. Anderson, feel that peace. Uh, I, I hope so. <laughs> so I mean, I, I can't I, say that I exude it very much. <laughs> I, I feel it. And, and I'm in Birmingham and you're in Atlanta and we're on the screen. But I'm such a strong believer in the fact that we are in community and the communities we live in emit certain vibrations of love and peace and joy. I mean, the fruit of the spirit, um, right. Galatians 5.25, and, um, or the opposite. And, uh, and I do believe you scientists who tell us that our neurological functioning is accelerated when we are centered and peaceful and joyful and playful as opposed to being fearful and i i know that your team <clears throat> and also all of the people who've volunteered to be a part of the study uh who come in, in contact with you are, are feeling that i'm really really grateful for that yeah i i certainly hope so yeah i I think that um, one of the amazing things is uh, <clears throat> uh, that um, example that's set for us um, in terms of the person of Jesus Christ is such an um, amazing individual on so many different levels that, um, that you know, in comparison to, to um, his characteristics, all of us fall clearly far short and uh, um, yet uh, um, to continue to have such a high standard, but also the grace to live in the midst of one's own weaknesses and failures is important. Yeah. And, and also, um, I, I just, I love the fact that he not only believed in love, but he believed in this dimension of life that we call eternal life that we can yes. go ahead and experience now. And, uh, and it has all this, resurrection and resuscitation uh, qualities about it. So I'm, I'm really grateful for you. Thank you so much. And I'm really grateful for this time. Did I, you know, I, again, I say, I am not a scientist. Were there obvious questions that I did not ask <laughs> that I should have asked that my people are going to be very, very interested in, in terms of the vaccine? Or anything else having to do with the virus? So, so I, I think um, the good news is is that there's, uh, you know, it looks like probably six candidate uh, vaccines that that um, Operation Warp Speed will be funding um, uh, in through phase three clinical trials with several different approaches to uh, to the method of um, developing an immune response. And as such, uh, even if one method is completely not successful, there are several other approaches or methods that, that, um, that do exist. And so I think that that uh, does provide a tremendous amount of, uh, 
uh, hope actually at this point in time that um, that we are seeing things move through uh, relatively quickly. We haven't identified any big issues with any of the vaccines so far to date. And it does give us a good bit of hope that that the masks that we're all wearing, that the social distancing that we're all experiencing, the separation, all those things are hopefully going to end up being a temporary rather than a permanent uh, thing. And uh, that that is, I think, an important message for people to hear, being in there with your masks, being in there with taking care of yourself. Um, uh, we are making progress. It's not as it's about as fast as we could hope for. Uh, it's not as fast as any of us would like, but um, uh, we <clears throat> we do hope that um, that it won't be that terribly long till we have one or more vaccine options. It will be, I think, a challenge once the vaccine is licensed. Uh, from the standpoint that uh, that there will certainly be some limitations as far as the number of doses that are available and some recommendations about who can kind of get vaccine first and then uh, which groups get prioritized and so forth. That'll feel hard, but um, that's actually a good problem to have. Um, uh, the people that make those decisions will you know, try and make the best decisions possible and hang in there. Uh, I think that, um, that uh, hopefully next year, uh, next summer, we'll be in a much different state than we are right now. Very good. That's a pretty strong blessing right there, my friend. <laughs> thank you very much. And thank you, thank you for your time. And thank you for your work. It was a great honor to meet you and have a conversation with you. It was my pleasure. Really enjoyed talking with you. Thank you. Same here. Best wishes to you and to your congregation. Hang in there. Um, there is hope that, uh, that you'll be back in uh, uh, listening to... Uh, uh, Reverend Bacon before too long. Thank you, my friend. And You're thank welcome. you all for joining us. We'll see you next Sunday. Goodbye.